actually personalize it. Okay, so is it for or all or mathematics for, for some uh, uh, and, and dealing with the issues of inclusion as well. Um, then we, we over the past decade in UK have grappled with questions like um, should mathematical syllabus have more of functional mathematics, more of applications of mathematics, how do we introduce that? Do we teach it in schools with practical work? Do we have qualifications in functional mathematics? And what would they look like? And people have experimented with that quite a lot in the UK. Um, how, do, how do we deal with the gifted and talented children? And of course, how do we deal with the children of the special educational needs? Um, and is assessment um, a driving force in mathematics education? To some degree, that is always the case uh, in the modern world. Um, but actually, I think, you know, to be kind, uh, it's not the, the main driving force. So, I'm going to look at all these questions, but I'm going to also particularly concentrate on uh, two outcomes. One is, how do children perceive mathematics, mathematics through their education? And how do we, as a community of mathematical practitioners, in whatever role we find ourselves, how do we train or how do we um, produce teachers that are going to convey this sense of this is what kids like to do mathematics. Uh, and that's one of the things that I think we don't do enough of uh, and we should. So we're going to look at some role models. Uh, we're going to look at one uh, or a few examples. Uh, role models mathematicians, uh, and we're going to have clips from the courses and others as well. Uh, we're going to look at a historical account, but popular historical account, and uh, from an artistic point of view, of a film. So I want to show you the whole thing. So this is from the courses now. And in 1932, I met a Hungarian mathematician called Siton, who worked in mostly in, in, in trigonometric series, and he was a very good mathematician, but he was a bit crazy <laughs> as a mathematician. In fact, he was a borderline schizophrenic. They tell about him that he usually thought this <coughs> turned towards the wall and tall, but when he talked about mathematics, he talked sad. And he even made it in a Hungarian anecdote. Because once when, in 1937, when Two Island I visited him, he also had persecution complex. So he opened the door a crack and said, please come rather at another time and to another person. <laughs> 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 marshall, marshall. That sounds better in the game. <laughs> mathematicians there, one the original horse and the other one that he is talking about. So this is the image that we get and we're going to discuss that image a bit later. Who is but both Paul 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 So this the next one is a clip about a mathematician uh, and it's a kind of scientific uh, program uh, historical account of mathematics. You have this breathtaking view, all of a sudden you can see in all directions and, and, and things make sense. It's, 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 it's beautiful to understand something that you can understand before, but the problem is the moment you understand one thing that raises more questions. So in other words, the moment you climb one mountain, then you see off in the distance behind the head is much higher mountains. His theory is all about the fact that the mountains get higher and higher. And no, no range is even enough because there are always mountain ranges beyond any range that you can understand or conceive of. 
So this is tremendously liberating effect on mathematics, or ought to. But then, of course, people get scared. So they, they pull back from the edge of the precipice. What was inspiring for Cantor frightened his critics. They saw mathematics as the pursuit of clarity and certainty. Everything Cantor was doing, his irrational numbers and his illogical infinities, seemed to them to be eating away at certainty. He soon faced a deep and implacable hostility. This is the main lecture theatre in the university where Cantor spent his entire professional life. A life that he felt trapped in. And I think with some justification. Other mathematicians actually tried to prevent Cantor publishing his papers. Cantor always dreamed that he'd receive an invitation to one of the great universities like Vienna or Berlin, but there were invitations which never came. And he was also attacked personally. The great mathematician Henri Poincaré said that Cantor's mathematics was a sickness from which one day maths would recover. And worse, his one-time friend and teacher, Kronecker, said that Cantor was a corrupter of youth. to 
to defend uh, why they made um, this Barbadol said the wrong percentage to the journalist who actually wrote the story. And uh, the journalist pointed to the mistake of the percentage, and the woman said, Well, actually, I wasn't have a good math. <laughs> So, uh, but this, I just want to really for you to see this. This, are, this is a cross section. There are many, many examples like that. This is a cross section of what mathematics is portrayed, what mathematicians are portrayed like in modern media. And it's not actually very new. This is actually a particularly very old clip. Uh, so, what's, well, what, what, what does that mean? Um, there is a particular modern projection, an image of a mathematician and uh, a relationship with its original, as it were. So the majority of the children who go to school, and actually the majority of the secondary math teachers are not ever going to meet a research mathematician. And that is because more than 50% of the math teachers are trained from non-pure mathematics background. So they're never going to actually come into contact with the research mathematician. So having images like this constantly thrown at them about what mathematicians should be like, and what mathemat doing mathematics means in terms of everyday life and also in terms of long-term life, uh, life choices, what you do after you finish mathematics and so on, is crucially important. Um, it really defines all these characteristics for quite a lot of people, for a substantial number of people uh, about mathematics. Um, and unfortunately, it defines also some of the things about the view of school mathematics. There is a very good article that I'll give at the end uh, some list of things that you can have a look at, uh, written by a um, British academic, uh, the School Mathematics and Watson. School Mathematics and Real Mathematics, I think it's called. Uh, and it describes the difference between just the everyday culture of mathematics classroom and everyday culture of doing mathematics at an undergraduate institution and postgraduate institute. And she actually gives examples of, of how just students interact and what they're faced with. And it really is staggeringly different. And that is because we actually don't have included in our teacher training any kind of or guidance for teachers, any kind of system whereby we say, well, this is actually desirable, but this is not. Um, you know, go and see what actually doing mathematics means. Um, and try to pull some mathematics yourself. And so one of the recent, well, a recent report, thank you, an old report, Raymond Smith, which was very, very influential in the UK mass education community, um, identified mathematics education really uh, as, as pretty poor. Uh, and the, the problem for that was the lack of um, lack of subject knowledge and lack of um, ability to inspire uh, mathematics uh, students. Now, since then, a lot actually has changed. So, since 2004, um, one of the recommendations of that report was to found to, to establish a, a national centre to help. Teachers. So in 2006, the National Center for Excellence in the Teaching of Mathematics was founded. And they did quite a good uh, amount of very good work in supporting teachers. The greatest, I think, um, impact they made on education, the mathematics education community in the UK, has been that they've actually, uh, they, they had a system of grants, small grants, to give to math teachers to support them to start their own research. And that, to a certain degree, established a reasonably existent, as a, <laughs> if, not, if not big, but a reasonable mathematics education research community amongst British mathematics teachers. Uh, unfortunately, they don't have that much money anymore. Uh, but that is something that really is worthwhile. Um, so, let's go back to what do these images mean? Well, I think they're completely putting off the lot. They should be. I agree with Paul Erdos. I mean, he was notably exactly, notably weird himself. I mean, uh, you know, what's the image there? That you're very, very eccentric, you're, you're totally put off, you're completely unable to have uh, normal and human <coughs> adult relationships. That, that's definitely one of the... Uh, one of the 
projections, I suppose. Uh, although he had many friends, so... He had many friends, but he never had any um, uh, uh, relations, any person. Well, I mean, it's, it's just saying that it's going to be a bit weird yeah. to do mathematics. So I think that is One of the things that, from all these images and from any image that I actually see, there is always this question from uh, and that's what leaps at you as well from the, in the classroom. Kids constantly come up with this. When will we need this? Um, because not only is my practice portrayed as um, something that is slightly weird, and we're going to go into that a little bit further, but something that it, it, there is no application. And I, by this, don't mean it should show applications in the real world all the time. It actually should show something else, which I'll talk about later on. But uh, to the question, I have to be stressed. To the question at uh, when will we need this, I always answered with having this in my table and giving the exact date in the future. But the common thread. Well, they are portrayed, the conditions are usually seem portrayed as inept and obsessive human beings. Uh, girls find that stuff. In practice, actually, that is not the case anymore. You go to any school, uh, but it's still in the media, it, should, it sort of seems like it. Uh, and the confidence of boys is higher as a result, although in, in reality, it doesn't seem to sort of have any basis. Um, only geniuses are good at maths, and normal people find it too difficult. And professors at MIT go on their knees when they find the student. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they are geniuses, but they are, again, inept with everything else. Um, there is some kudos to this, and there is some alternative answer to these. I have some videos at the end, if we have time, I'll show you those, uh, of people making a joke at this particular view of mathematics. So there is some kudos to this and such people obviously making fun of it as well, uh, but the appeal is limited. Just imagine how many people see this and how many people are able to answer to this in any confident way. Um, and the most important, I think, is that the expectations seem to be too high, but in order to understand even mathematics, to enjoy mathematics, you have to be a nerd, um, and you have to be so good that you know your professor is falling on his knees. So it's, it's the, the, the stakes are too high. If you're not that good, you're not going to be a success. And and this is something that seems not to work in other subjects, which we'll go to as well. Um, so some other messages I thought were. Well, probably you won't understand it because from the, when you look at the film, when you look at that film, for example, um, it never at any point do they actually explain this is what it is on the board. Uh, there was another film which was absolute disaster. Oxford murders. I don't know how many people saw that. Have you seen that? And that was so funny because even the, the simplest arithmetic, I think he counted, or, or he did Fibonacci, first few Fibonacci numbers, and he got that wrong, you know. Um, and so, so even the simple, simple mathematics is either portrayed in the wrong, or just plainly not given, and I don't understand why that can't be done. Um, but the message is, you, can, you won't understand it, don't try. Don't try to, to get into it. Um, also, it's, it's lacking in innovation. There's almost nothing you can do. It's already all been discovered. It can solve some problem, right? But, you know, you, what, what, what about that? And, um, and the mass teachers are portrayed usually as very boring people, unless they're nerdy. In which case, that's acceptable. Okay, another one from the course is mine. Perhaps I could best describe my experience of doing mathematics in terms of entering a dark mansion. He goes into the first room and it's dark, completely dark. One stumbles around, bumping into the furniture. That's <laughs> actually <laughs> where each piece of furniture is. And finally, after 
six months or so, you find the light switch, you turn it on, <laughs> suddenly it's all illuminated. You can see exactly where you were. <laughs> oh my God. At the beginning of September, I was sitting here at this desk when suddenly, totally unexpectedly, I had this incredible revelation. It was the most, uh, the most important moment of my working life. Nothing I ever do again. I really like this tip. This is a very important tip. I think it's so emotional and it sort of shows obviously what, what it means to the mathematics. But nevertheless, it again gives an image. And I, I, I'm not against this kind of image because it's a true. This is from the horse's mouth, you know. Uh, but again, as soon as the kids see this clip, they go and when they sort of see the room like you did, oh my god, you know. It's like, but it's, it's not me. This is what maths means. It actually means not being me. But there are, you know, there are some other things as well. Um, okay. You do not need to do this trouble with Andrew Watts. You know, sure, so, actually, why, why should we bother about this um, culture of doing mathematics? Um, well, I think there are two, two different, obviously, areas popularization in education and should educators have anything to do with the popularization that's debatable everyone will have their own view I don't think, you know, I don't think that should be such sort of prescribed as it were uh, but people should be aware of it especially teachers should be aware, aware of what is the popular sort of view of mathematics um, questions like what it means to be a mathematician from that clip of Andrew Wilde the last one um, people got really excited about that. That actually went viral around maths classrooms in the UK. But why, why do you think people got excited? Any idea? Is there a consult? And the world is. So it's a question. Why do we get excited about the class theorem? Yes, why, why, did, why did teachers and kids get excited about this particular, pro for example, program? It, because this particular program like, and kids, but that this yeah. specific kid went viral around the internet. Well, it's exciting to see a mathematician who gets emotional in it, but also they, they got excited because they thought this was the only move in mathematics. <laughs> they actually, this was the only piece of new mathematics that they got hold of. There's very little in the mathematics education system whereby the teachers are exposed to new mathematics. There's very little that they know of that comes out. And hence, there is no excitement about it. And, and, and also there's no excitement in the kids. So, you know, so anyway, I'll actually go back to the history of mathematics because the history of mathematics can offer that, um, can, can, can offer to bridge that. So, it also seems that, from what we've seen before, that the current popular view tends towards mathematics as an elitist field. So we just had a little bit of that discussion in the previous talk. Um, for good or bad, this is kind of a trade. It's not for everyone. Yet, everyone is going to learn it. You have to do it. And then now, there's going to be a new directive. Everyone has to go up to the age of 18. And yet, everyone, as far as I can tell there's very there's probably a few schools in England you can probably count them on, on, on the fingers of one hand. They, they, they don't have stream stream class uh, classes in mathematics. That means that um, let's say you have five classes in mathematics in a year. One is going to be the top class. Four is going to be not top class. The children are going to say I'm the second class. To them, it doesn't matter whether they are second best or fifth best, or, or the bottom of the pile. <coughs> to, to them, it only matters if they're not in the top class. 
and no amount of persuasion that the, 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 the parents are going to say is going to make a slight difference when they're actually faced with going to the classroom and in that classroom they know that they're not in the top set. And it's, it's to do with the peer sort of perception. It's nothing to do with what we as parent educators and or parents as parents can do about it. And I think that is the, huge, the, the, the greatest problem. If you, if you think about um, if you think about adolescent psychology, okay, so just read a little bit about what it means to be accepted. As you grow, when you're a kid, obviously you want to be accepted by your family. As you grow, if you're not accepted by, by your peers, the, you know, you create huge stresses and strains in your life for, forever. So at that point in time, and in mathematics in particular, you're, taught, you're being told you're not actually very good. And the children interpret mathematics as being clever or being thick. So, on thickness, okay, so if you're thick, what can you do? You can say, the only thing you can do is switch off completely, shut down all your social sciences to mathematics because that way you can say, well actually I'm not doing it because I've chosen not to. So, from there on, that child is never going to want to actually do it better. There might be some slight differences in other ways that that child might want to make a difference in terms of, I'm going to, you know, their parents have big influence, so they're going to want to get reasonable results uh, at the exam and so on. But emotionally, deeply, they're never going to want to do it because of, really, to keep their own dignity, intellectually, as it were, because they're told not to. So, you also need to be a little bit unstable with the tendency to being that. Um, it's attractive, definitely, for those wanting to overcome gender bias. So, there's, there's quite a lot of girls who want to do maths. Uh, it will be a lonely work. Uh, it is an intense work. So, for example, all of those have portrayed really intense pictures of doing mathematics. And not everyone is like that. And as far as I can tell, not all mathematicians are like that either. And you don't have to be, but you should go with this craft okay. So, why should we bother? Should we bother at all? I think we should bother because, to me, it doesn't... You know, having this society of people thinking about this is how we want to think mathematically is not about producing only a genius. It's about producing a society of people who are actively engaged about thinking mathematically in some way. And it's a sort of collective like enterprise and if we don't have this culture of collective sort of thinking about how we're going to do it, it's not going to happen. Um, cognition includes the media, it does include sort of what people throw at us, and more so it, uh, it matters to those who actually don't know enough about it. So there, there's no defense system, defense mechanism for, for those people to say, no, that's rubbish. Consider yourselves, if you have read Dan Brown's, um, what was it called? Uh, the Mitch Code. Has anyone read that book? No one. You have read it? Well, I, I read it only because I. I had to read it because I was getting so annoyed <coughs> and because everyone was reading it around me in the school where I worked. It was a Catholic school. So everyone was reading and loving it. And I said, it's all wrong. Can't you see? This is wrong and that's wrong. And this is wrong. But people had absolutely no idea. They had no... The, there was nothing that they could base things on because they had no idea of basic mathematical fact. Um, that is portrayed in that book. So that is the popular, you know, this, this is what it is, you know. Quite a lot of people would, since then, having read that kind of book, think they know all about golden section and Fibonacci numbers. Okay. So it's important to please math teachers and really their children to know that they don't know that. Um, and also, what about the information that kids can find on their own? So there's a, a a mine field of information like that on the internet. And when we talk about using media in learning mathematics, we've mentioned the blackboards, uh, I'm going to mention a little bit of computers, 
But what about also media like what we've looked at now? That is also a, a, a tool, I think. And it is a tool also because it allows us to create this cultural setting for doing mathematics. It doesn't have, you don't have to have videos in your classroom. I also do not, I'm not saying, you know, teachers should, should all have videos in their classrooms or, you know, fancy sort of computers so everyone can do internet. What I'm saying is you have to create a, a, an atmosphere where everyone will be open-minded to learning about what it means to do mathematics and being able to make a judgment on the media that they're going to see when they come out of their classroom. And at the moment, that does not happen. So if they come to the classroom, they have a class or a lesson totally devoid of references to what it means to do mathematics. And then they come out and they have this media hitting on them. So what is the teacher for? Um, well, we can sort of discuss and debate that to the end of time. Um, I also think it's important uh, Sasha mentioned uh, the article masterclass. It's definitely very important to be able to do that. But if you put yourself in the position of a child, and that child has to do five hours, six hours of what you're doing for these three days, okay, every day, September to July. So how many masterclasses can you take? <laughs> how many? You know, ask any child if they have to sit five hours a day listening to that, to someone else doing things, there is a limit to how much you can take. You have to have time to allow yourselves or to allow your kids to just think and just do stuff. And I think that is what, um, where we miss the point. There is a lot of teaching about discovery model, so you, you teach teachers how to do heuristic teaching in math or mathematics. But there is very little of allowing just time to think. Just giving children time to sort of really communicate perhaps with themselves and just do things that you have set them. Homework is dead. Forget about homework. It's, it ain't going to happen. <coughs> and you get, they get out of school and they go home and everyone has Sky in their room and everyone has computer games and everyone has everything else. So unless the homework is something to do, find me, find on the internet about something, you know, only children from a from a middle and upper middle class are going to be able to do that. Uh, to, to concentrate on actually doing homework. Other children aren't. So you have to allow for that to happen in school. And you have to allow also how to do mathematics. And I said this particularly because I, don't, I didn't mean how to do this, okay, I'm going to.